Hey Sharks fans, welcome to The Chomp, a monthly compilation of some of the best Sharks content we know you'll love. Coming up on the show, Sharky and some of your favorite Sharks players trade places with Southwest employees. You'll meet Sharks fan Addison Kiprios, a very special kid who had the experience of a lifetime with Team Teal. But first, we get a mid-season roundup with our Sharks broadcast team as they assess the first half of the season and look to the future. With the great Drew Amanda, Dan Rusinowski, Brett Hedick, and I'm Randy Hahn. Welcome to the Hockey Roundtable without a table, the hot stove without a stove, the fireside chat without a fire. But on we go to talk a little hockey. And guys, I want to start by talking about the, uh, the highlights so far in this year that hasn't had enough of them. And... I think first about the, the win over Philadelphia. Thankfully, it happened after 11 games to start the season uh, without one. Uh, think about other games like the overtime win against the Rangers. Tomas Hurdle scoring that big goal, beating Vancouver after they dropped the 10 spot on the Sharks earlier in the season. But for me, it's the game in Detroit. And it was really the culmination of that road trip that started in New Jersey almost beating the Rangers, then roaring back to beat the Islanders. But that game in Detroit for me was off the hook. The Sharks dominated the first period, got nothing. Detroit comes out for nothing. Okay, you're starting to sag. Sharks come right back, four in a row to tie it. Then Larkin scores. What Red Wings go ahead again. Sharks tie it. Granlin wins it in overtime. All on a night. Oddly, when the Sharks overshadow Patrick Kane's debut, and he recently overshadowed Chris <laughs> Chelios' retirement, so I guess uh, it was due. But for me, that was the highlight of this year so far, because as I said at the time, we've seen a lot of remarkable Sharks games in the past, but I had never seen one quite like that. To be dominant, then get dominated, then roar back, and then win it in such thrilling fashion. Yeah, incredible season, the, it, part of the season when the, the Sharks were able to come back. And of course, it echoed memories of uh, 2019, down by three against Vegas in game seven. But this is regular season action. And actually, in some ways, it's a bigger grind because, the, because of that road trip. Uh, I, I look at the Islander game for me. I think the Islander game was a big, big game for the San Jose Sharks because they, they really could have just folded and, and gone home after that and not even done anything on the road trip. For me, it was that game. I got to go back to the Ranger game, the one that you mentioned, Hunter, on that trip, on that road trip. Uh, just how they came from behind by a couple of goals late. They almost scored there to tie the game with a few seconds left. I think that was that moment where they started to kind of feel like, hey, they could go against a top team in this league when they play their way they know they can and they know that they could score goals late in a hockey game that they were not going to give up. I thought that was the kind of the start of what we saw later on, on that road trip. And at times this team has, has found that little next gear to get themselves back in games. Uh, aside from every time we're in the booth together, what was the feel good moment for you? Well, it, nothing tops that, as you know. <laughs> uh, the Vancouver game where they came back, where, where, where when Vancouver came in and hammered the Sharks, and then the Sharks next game won, the, it was like the old days here. The stands were packed, the fans were into it, they were jumping, it was, a, it was like the old days. So. Being a boomer, I guess I can look back in the old days and it was the best time ever, boy, I'll tell you that. But, but I, and then, of course, every time I'm with you in the booth. Of course. And even right, like this moment right now, it's a highlight. Exactly. <laughs> it's been a year of development and Mike Greer has admitted that we're in the beginning stages of turning this around, the, the franchise is. Danny, what have you seen as far as individual players blossom this year that sticks out for you? Well, Fabian Zetterlin, for me, I, I think he's, you know, he's tied for the Sharks' lead in scoring as we uh, chat here today. Um, he's going to overtake Tomas Hurdle, obviously, who's out with an injury. He's somebody that was a lost soul, I think, last season when he got traded, and he talked about how awkward it was. And I think the big thing that happened with him was he stayed here for much of the summer, trained, got used to the Bay Area, started to really like it, got comfortable, and now he's just a different hockey player. Um, the way that he's using his size, he can skate, he's uh, got a great shot, and he's uh, showing some promise. He's having his ups and his downs, as all young players do. Uh, William Eklund is another one who, who comes to mind. I think that the hardest thing to do is develop at the NHL level. And you've got the pressure on a player like Eklund or Nikita Okotyuk to try to develop at this level. Eklund's had more ice time, but I've really been impressed in the second half of the year. He's one of the best scorers on this team and since the second half started. And that's another player. But then you've got to talk about the guys who influence these young guys. 
Uh, Mikhail Granlund, what a story. I, I don't think anybody expected that he was going to be a guy that would be part of the solution. They probably thought that he was going to be a guy that they'd pick up, he'd have a decent season, and they might move him because they didn't want to keep him. But I think that David Quinn and Mike Greer have shown a lot more interest in him in being part of the solution for the team. So that, that's, that's another guy. And of course, Mario Ferraro maturing. I have to look at a defenseman when I talk about that because he's really matured, I think, as a leader, but also in the way that he manages his ice time. I think he's done a lot better with that one particular area. And the last thing, the goaltending. The fact that it has not been an issue at all uh, with either Mackenzie Blackwood or maybe the most improved goaltender uh, in, in the last few years for the Sharks and Capo Kakin and the way that he changed the style of game, the way that he was dedicated to working with Thomas Spear and has a great relationship with Mackenzie Blackwood too. Those are some of the highlights for me. We just want to take everybody so we leave nothing for Brett to me. <laughs> Typical play-by-play -play guy. Right. <laughs> you can have it. The hand wasn't up. I, 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 le I left you five or six players. Well, Mackenzie Blackwood, I, I think you mentioned Blackwood. I think think, think of the 51 save uh, first opening night for him, uh, his first game, I mean, that he played for the Sharks. I, I think that was kind of the beginning of something that we saw, that this is a goaltender that could be with this franchise for years to come. That's something for me I think I'll always remember. Could probably go back in even into the, your last question, or that your last topic there, Andy, the fact that a, a game that you can remember this season for Blackwood. Yep. Uh, Henry Thrun is another player who's come in this year, and he hasn't established himself yet, Drew. He just doesn't have the body of work yet and coming straight out of college. But uh, he seems to be here for the rest of the season at this point now. Uh, and it's, as Danny said, it's hard to develop in the NHL, but he's, he's learning on the job. Missing games um, because of injury or, or not in the lineup and then comes back and, and it's hard. Brett can tell us better than anybody. It's hard to get that consistency if you don't get the consistency of shifts and ice. But what I love about Henry is this. There's nothing that rattles this kid. He's smart. He's a smart player. He's, 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 he told us. Remember when we told us when we asked him about, you know, you don't get excited out there. He goes, I tried to once and I was terrible that day. <laughs> so I, I love him for that. I, I mean, I mean, just to add to that too, because I'm I was the same way, Drew. If I got too fired up, it, it actually prevented me from playing my best. No way, you yeah, got too I had fired to, up. I had to, yeah, yeah, yeah. No way. <laughs> you actually had to tone it down. Yeah, I would have to absolutely have to tone it down, as you can tell, most days uh, down in the dungeon there of our offices. But um, I love that with Henry Thrun. Ty Emerson, another player that we have to talk about. He hasn't played that many games in the National Hockey League. And both these young defensemen with Mook Madulin, who really has impressed me with his short few games with the Sharks. Yeah, and I want to touch on Mook Madulin with Drew in a minute. But before that, we're headed to the trade deadline. The Sharks are open for business. That's apparent. Um, what's it like in the room, Hetty? You've been through this scenario on both ends of it, a team looking to add and then a team looking to shed over your 1,000-plus uh, game career. What, what's, what's it like? Well, I think the thing that that you want to consider is is a player that's usually an unrestricted free agent that people are talking about to get moved is a guy that has had a lot of games played already in this league and if you're not wanting to go and try to win a Stanley Cup I've got to ask you why you know that this is a tough situation that the Sharks are in right now if you could help the Sharks organization on the way out by getting a draft choice for your services and you could then go and try to win a Stanley Cup somewhere uh, why not and so I think for all these players and the guys that I know that right now, LeBanc, Hoffman, Duclair, Barabanov, Bailey, Carpenter, uh, Kakinen, these guys are all unrestricted free agents. Teams could want to get their services. But I think overall, as a player inside that room, you know that this time of year, when you haven't had a successful season as a group, you know that you could get moved. And that's just part of the business. Drew, post-deadline, yeah. assuming the Sharks make some moves, some players go out the door, that's going to give an opportunity for some players with the Barracuda to step in here and, and get some experience, get their beaks wet, if you will, in the NHL. You've had an opportunity to work a lot of those games with Nick Nolenberger on the AHL broadcast this season. What has stuck out for you as players who maybe we haven't seen yet or in a case like of a Mook Madulin that we've seen a little bit of? He's the one that jumps out for, for sure. Shakir is, he's to me, the real deal. Uh, and I know it's really, really early in his career, but guys, this guy's a stud. And another guy who's... I want to put a heart rate monitor on him because he doesn't seem to get too excited out there. Big, big kid, lots of range, not afraid to shoot the puck. And uh, if he puts some muscle on, uh, he's going to be like, if he gets into Brett Hedekin training, he was, he will be, he'll be the future that the Sharks look at for a long period of time. Daniel Gustian has been really good, but he's been injured a lot this year. Their goaltending has really improved. Way to go, you're getting the block off, but they still need some seasoning. 
I like Nathan Todd, but Nathan's an older guy out there. Um, Cole Castles is the one other guy that sticks out for me that he could be. He could be somebody that you look forward to as being maybe a good third line center in the National Hockey League. But to be honest, they still have some work to do on that team. They still have to be able to draft more guys and develop more players. But as far as the way that they're playing as now as we speak, as the way they were earlier, the players have. Johnny McCarthy and that crew have done a very good job. But the two the two guys that jump out for me are, are Shakir and Gushin. And Drew, how about the fact that Radim Shimek has gone there and oh. been a great captain for that team? The fact that he is the captain of the team and is proud of it, I, I think that's a big deal. You have to have a couple of veterans like that to help these kids along. That's your hockey round table. I prefer Swimming with the Sharks. When we return, you'll meet Addison Kiprios, a young Sharks fan who lived every Sharks fan's dream. Welcome back to the show. Big time Sharks fan Addison Kiprio suffers from a rare genetic disorder that leaves her allergic to sunlight, but as you'll see, nothing can stop Addie from enjoying the sport she loves so much. To bring some light into her life, an organization called Shadow Jumpers teamed up with the Sharks to give Addison and her family the experience of a lifetime, and luckily, making waves was along for the ride. Well, I'm catching you after you've had quite a day already. So take us through how this day started and what you've been up to. Um, so I just like first came here and then I got to meet everyone, hang out with Sharky. And then I went to the bench, meet like most of the players. And then I got told that I get to go skate with them. So then I got off, like, off the bench, and then I went to go to the locker room, got dressed, and then I got to learn some tips and like learn more stuff about hockey with them. Then they gave me a tour around the building, and yeah. So that's and that's just the beginning because you have like a whole day and a half left. Yeah. You're gonna go to the game. Do you know what's gonna happen there? Um, yes, I'm gonna give like a speech or something like that. Can you give a speech? What do you think you're gonna say? I don't know. You yeah. don't know? <laughs> So let's kind of rewind this, this whole situation. How did this come about? It was technically all the shadow jumpers. Can I ask you about this rare genetic disorder that you have? I just know it's like someone allergic to the sun. Like. Okay, so allergic to the sun. So what does that mean? That means like you can't go in the sunlight and like you have to wear all this stuff to like protect you. No skin can be showing, like only pretty much just your eyes, everything's covered up. And is this something you've been living with your whole life? Yes. My understanding is though that you haven't let it stop you from anything, that you love being outside, even if you have to cover up your whole mm -hmm. body, that you just like getting out there, right? Yeah. And you also love hockey. Yes. Okay, so tell me about your, your hockey journey. When do you first remember skating? Probably like when I was like seven maybe. I was at like an open skate and I was just like learning how to skate and everything. What do you love about it? It's just fun to hang out with a lot of people. It's a fun game to play and it's very competitive, like I like competitive. So I walked in right as you were on the ice with Justin Bailey and Anthony Duclair and I thought you looked excellent. Like would you consider yourself a good hockey player? Because I think you yeah. are. Yeah. What's your what's your strength? What's your greatest strength? Probably shooting the puck backhand. Backhand. That's yeah. like that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Your dad told me that you were um, sad about missing practices at home. Is yeah. this making up for it a little bit? Yeah. Okay, did you pick up any pointers from, from uh, Anthony and Justin? I learned some tips for doing face-offs, 
um, how to shoot the puck like in a better way. Are you going to take that back to your team? Yes. <laughs> Does your whole team know about what's happening? Some people do, but I don't think my whole team knows. Okay, so what do you think the rest of the your trip is going to be like? Amazing. <laughs> yeah. What are you looking forward to most at, at the game? I've never been to an NHL game before, so this would be my first one. And I feel like that would be really cool because some kids on my hockey team, they're like, NHL games are the best, like you'll enjoy it. And so I'm really excited for just the game. The game is going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to see the practice today, right? Yes. So what surprised you about that? Because I, I know when I watch, I can't believe how fast they Yes, go. they skate really fast. They pass the puck really like, like, they're just really good when they're like practicing and you're just watching them. It's really cool. Well, I think it's so exciting to be here with you and it'll be really fun to watch you at the game too. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this. Thank you. Addison, we will see you in the PWHL, no doubt. Next up, meet Corbray Smith, the artist behind this year's Black History Month jerseys. My name is Corbray Smith. I'm an Afrofuturist artist, and I'm from Oakland, California. I wanted my design to not focus on the struggle. I think the struggle is important, and also we need to be celebrated, and I wanted to pull from my experience and you know my black experience growing up in the 90s was beautiful. The colors um, are forms of expression like hip hop was like just brand new so I wanted to pull from what I consider like the black renaissance which was um, the 90s. Yeah I thought of like Tribe Called Quest, I thought of De La Soul, I thought of Moesha, um, I thought of just like all the things that were quintessential for a black kid growing up in that time and I tried to like infuse it together somehow. San Jose has a huge hockey culture, um, which is so interesting to me. Cause I, you don't see that like in Oakland or San Francisco. Um, and I've done some murals in San Jose, but like I feel like this is a way for me to really speak to people who live here, especially like the black folks who live here. You know, I think San Jose is very Latinx heavy. Um, which is beautiful. Um, but one thing that we don't necessarily see a lot is like black artists or black iconography in San Jose. So I'm also glad that I get to like infiltrate and, you know, get to speak to those people. When we return, some of your favorite Sharks players and Sharky trade places with Southwest employees. See how they did after the break. Welcome back to The Chomp. Here at The Sharks, we love to showcase players' personalities, and what better way to do that than to watch the guys try something new? This is a story with a lot of baggage, as The Sharks and Sharky trade places with Southwest Airline employees. Didn't you say that you are going to be a pilot or something? Yeah, I wanted to do my license. Uh, I haven't found the time yet. employees here who are going to be your escorts. If you have any questions at any time, just ask them with what's going on and we'll keep you safe. Do sharks have noses? Snout. 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 So first things first, we'll go uh, train Sharky how to want. <laughs> How's it going? We'll give you a little briefing. We got gate 26 out here. We got 
The J line coming down the middle, that's what the plane's gonna be coming down on. We have our stop markings. We'll have Sharky back here on the marshalling line, the plane's gonna be coming down. We'll have one of you two guys on both wings with uh, one of our agents doing the wing walking. The plane will come in. When Sharky stops the plane, we'll wait for the captain to give us the signal saying that the engines are cut and we're cleared to enter the safety zone. Hi, it's Andrew Warson, Chief Operating Officer of Southwest Airlines. At Southwest Airlines, we are committed to San Jose and the South Bay. We connect people to what's important in their lives, and in the South Bay, that's Sharks hockey. We had a great opportunity with uh, the Sharks players to work with our people, what we call our Southwest Warriors, on the ramp and in the terminal to help serve our customers with love and hospitality, the Southwest and Sharks way. Hi, I'm Jonathan Becker, President of Sharks Sports and Entertainment. We love our partnership with Southwest Airlines for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them is based on the old song. You know the song, Do You Know the Way to San Jose? Well, because of the San Jose Sharks and our good friends at Southwest, millions of people not only know the way, but they get there on Southwest Airlines. Today it was fun to see three sharks actually trading places and participate in the Southwest boarding and unboarding process. Well, three sharks plus that sharky guy, of course, as well. Uh, it's a little bit of humor, but showed the real life personalities behind our players and all the hundreds of thousands of workers at Southwest that are sort of the unsung heroes for every day. Now if we can get some of those to come put on skates and pretend to be players, that would be really trading places. Thanks again for everything you've done, Southwest. We very much appreciate your partnership. Let's go Sharks. I don't want to mess up anyone. <laughs> this lever off. You're gonna turn this lever closed. Which turn way? to the right. Turn to the right. Other way. Oh. There you go. So it clicks. Yeah. You're gonna twist that off and pull it. Oh That is awesome. That does it for this edition of The Chomp. We'll be back next month with some of our favorite stories from the San Jose Sharks, and we promise it'll be a lot of fun.